Hi everyone and welcome to this webinar. Um, I just want to let you know that we'll just wait a couple of minutes more in order to have more people connecting. In the meanwhile, feel free to reach uh, out by writing on the chat. And if you want to switch to another language, just select the other language from the bottom button that says your language. I'll uh, leave the webinar paused for a couple of more minutes and we will write back. Okay, everyone, welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, I think we're gonna get started and hopefully more people will join uh, along the way. Uh, my name is Andrea, I'm from Voice Boxer here just to introduce you to the use of this platform, which is a new platform that you're using for this webinar series. Um, it's pretty easy to use. Uh, what do you want to know in order to engage during this uh, uh, interesting webinar is that you can use uh, the chat that you can find on the right side of the screen. You can use the chat in every language you want and you, you will be able to translate the messages in the language that you select. Today the webinar will be uh, in English with live interpretation into French and Spanish. You can select your language by clicking on the menu at the bottom where it says your ling language. In addition, uh, you can reach out to technical support if you're experiencing any problem with audio uh, by clicking on the question mark that is on the bottom left. I'll now give the floor uh, to Cindy, who will introduce uh, the webinar. Cindy, here's to you. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who wherever you are. Uh, welcome to our third webinar in this Women's Rights and Climate Finance Knowledge Building Series. Uh, this uh, series is co-organized by WIDO and both ends as a member of the Global Alliance on Green and Gender Action, GAGA, and supported by the Wallace Global Fund. And we appreciate that you are on with us today, particularly in this busy week, um, where I expect many of us are also holding events celebrating International Women's Day tomorrow. So congratulations in advance on that. And thanks for joining today. My name is Cindy Coltman. I work for Both Ends, uh, which is an environmental and human rights-based organization in Amsterdam. So we work on uh, environment and climate justice issues with many partners around the world. I will be the facilitator today, and uh, I will be that along with my co-organizers, Bridget Burns of WIDO and Don Robin of Both Ends, part of today's discussion. So our purpose is to look more deeply into the broad landscape of what is meant by climate finance, and in particular, the Green Climate Fund, the GCF, which will be the largest climate fund. And we're holding these webinars to help women's rights and environmental funds and grassroots groups build power in this space so that each of you and each of us can make informed decisions on if and how we want to engage, as there are many options. So whether it's through monitoring the flow of funds coming into um, our countries in the form of climate mitigation and adaptation projects, or lobby and advocacy for better policy and practice, of how these projects are awarded, or deciding to try to actually access this funding directly for our communities. And that's a bit about, that's where we're gonna to focus today's topic. So before we start, um, Andrea gave you a bit about this new platform. This is the very first time that a webinar, we are trying a new platform. Um, and it's, it's because we got the request to try to be in multiple languages. And so this is a new platform. It's very exciting, a little intimidating for us also as organizers and speakers, but um, it, but it allows multilingual presentations and conversations. And that's so we can better include our sisters and brothers around the world. Um, the, let me, before I start, uh, just give you one more thing um, that Andrea pointed out. Uh, because it's a new platform, you're going to notice right away that there's no um, ability for us to raise hands on this. So that's because the platform uh, really relies on the chat box um, because we can't unmute you 
um, spontaneously in this platform, and that's because of simultaneous translation. But so our advice is this: is you, if you want to give a question or comment anonymously, please just direct that channel. There's something called presenters. Just go ahead and put your question in, or comments there. But for the rest, we actually advise if we can all stay in the general channel, then everybody can see the comments, the questions coming in, and um, and, and, and what's very, very cool about this um, platform is that you can go ahead and ask your question or comment in, in, in the language you've chosen, English, French, or Spanish. And then if you see something coming in as another language, you, there's a little translate button um, above each comment person who put it in, and you can hover your cursor there, and it'll translate it to you. So um, please, let's uh, use the chat boxes um, throughout. And I'm going to give you a little bit um, for the next slide here. I'm going to tell you a little bit of how we're going to start. So we are going to use the first 50 to 60 minutes of this webinar and have three speakers who each have a different perspective on this topic, getting the money to the people, GCF accreditation and enhanced direct access. And I really want to thank our speakers in advance today for participating, because it's quite late in the evening for um, Balor and for Raju uh, in Asia. So thank you for staying and, and warmly welcome you today. So our first speaker is going to be um, Ms. Balor Legum. She's the program director of the Mongolian Women's Fund, or MONAS, as they call themselves. And, and Balor is going to talk about her and MONAS's journey into why, as a women's fund, they are following climate finance and how they have chosen so far to engage in their country. And then second, we will have Raju Pandit Chetri. He is the executive director of the Pakriti Resources Center in Nepal. And Raju is just back from the latest uh, GCF board meeting last week. And Raju is going to talk about building national level access to the GCF funds um, and about a particularly about a pilot program that is going on right now called Enhanced Direct Access that enables smaller organizations to gain access to the funding. And then third, we are going to have Ms. Lisa Andon, Deputy Director, and William Kostka, uh, Executive Director of the Micronesia Cons Conservation Trust. And the Micronesia Conservation Trust is an organization that um, many of us as civil society organizations have been celebrating with because at the end of the last year, um, they were successful as the first small grants fund to get full accreditation to the GCF. And, and, and given that Lisa and William are based in Micronesia, which is 1 a.m. in the morning right now, um, it was a little too much for them to be live with us, but it's, their story is just incredibly um, important to share, um, uh, particularly for funds who are thinking about the direct access process. So um, they actually pre-recorded their, their presentation, and that's what we're going to hear um, during this. And those of us like Don and Bridget and myself who are familiar with the process, we'll try to answer the questions that come up um, after the, the video. And uh, Lisa and William are, are very um, interested in, in engaging further anybody who has further questions. So in between each of the speaker presentations, we're going to stop and ask for a few clarifying questions from all of you and that um, we'll keep track of coming up in the chat boxes. And then after the three speakers, we hope we're going to have be able to open up the two, a fuller discussion and address more questions that come up. So before I hand over to Balor, our first speaker, I'm going to take a few more minutes to update those of you who are maybe new to our series and um, on some of the knowledge we shared during the first two webinars and the process we're following. I, I know I can't do justice to the rich amount of information that was shared by our speakers, but as a quick catch up um, so that you can decide if you want to re-listen to the first two webinars um, and the links are there below, um, here's what we discussed. So the first one, webinar one, was an introduction to climate finance and it was an overview of what we call the landscape of climate finance organizations and experiences with gay in engaging with these processes at the national and global levels. And that, in that webinar, Bridget Burns and Don Robin actually shared their um, um, experience in this. 
And in that webinar, we were actually really pleased that um, Titi Sorrentoro from Axi Indonesia had also joined us. And she, Titi is somebody who has followed the GCF from almost the beginning. Um, and she shared with us her perspective and her experience as a Southern activist and a Southern organization in, in, in that space. And one of the things that Titi talked about was how to ensure participation of civil society and local communities in the decision-making processes, um, and how to ensure that there's a bottoms-up approach in the designing of the project, the programs, and what she was doing in Indonesia with women's and environmental groups on the ground. Our second webinar then, we decided to go deeper into, okay, what is the gender policy of the GCF um, in, in particular? And first, Bridget Burns of WIDU gave us an overview of the gender policies of three longer existing climate funds, the GEF, the Adaptation Fund, and the Climate Investment Fund. And then Leon Shalatek, who is from the Henrik Boll Foundation in North America and who is an expert on following GCF from the beginning, she went deep into the gender policy and um, in, in the GCF, and she highlighted the key opportunities and where there is room for improvement. And again, both these webinars are on this link below, as this webinar will be um, um, recorded and available. And one of the things that Leanne talked about was gender balance uh, in the GCF board and in the secretariat. And I thought it was noteworthy to take um, the two photos that were taken last week from the GCF 19th board meeting in Songdo, South Korea, and show them here. So here's first the GCF board. So you're going to count four women of the 24. So luckily, it's a little bit better in the CSO observers. So here you see you're going to see many, many um, of, um, of our uh, women leadership. And in particular, you see our three new GCF monitors, Masan, Maria, Julia, and Wanu um, in this photo. And these CSO observers to the board meetings are really important sources of information on GCF and on giving civil society voice and at times heavy criticism to what accredited organizations and the proposed projects are coming up for decision. And sharing some of the, their um, perspectives is going to be the focus of our next webinar in April. So if you want to save the date for April 12th, uh, same time, that's going to focus on strategies for organizing to influence, monitor, and track climate finance. And our last webinar in this particular series is going to be about funding for gender justice and climate justice outside of major climate mechanisms. So now I want to welcome uh, Balor. Balor Legem from Monis is going to give her presentation. And when I spoke to Balor um, in preparing for this webinar, um, I was really struck by how, for all of us, this is really a multi-layer journey um, in learning about climate finance. So I think you will find it really interesting to hear how that journey um, for Balor and for Monis evolved and is still evolving. And I pass the control to Balor now. Welcome. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is Yasmin here, so I'm just uh, saying good evening. Um, first of all, thank you, Cindy, for this opportunity to participate in this webinar. Um, so what I would like to start with is that as a Mongolian Women's Fund, as a Women's Fund, it was really a journey, and right now we feel that we are at the beginning of our journey and we are planning to go further and uh, uh, see what we can do and actually apply our, all our efforts and knowledge that we have collected so far to progressing. So very quickly, uh, for those who are new to Mongolian Women's Fund, I just want to give a small A small introduction to Mongolian Women's Fund. Mongolian Women's Fund was established in 2001, and we are a member of PROSPERA, an international network of women's funds. And um, we have uh, been distributing, uh, we have been raising funds, uh, mobilizing resources, and giving grants to women's groups um, 
at national, regional and local levels within Mongolia. So um, since the beginning of our work in Mongolia, we were very, very focused on women's rights, on promoting women's rights. But in 2013 and 2014, we received uh, several proposals from our um, women's, uh, women's groups from rural areas, especially remote rural areas, which were on poor quality of drinking water, on, you know, on women's issues in mining areas, on degradation of green areas in local small village. So we were quite surprised to see these proposals coming to, Mongol uh, to our organization because we had our focus and we had our strategy and these proposals weren't anywhere within our scope of work. But because these were our women's groups from remote rural areas um, who have very little access to funding and which could give them a good opportunity to develop as uh, uh, women's groups, um, we responded to these um, proposals and we gave grants. Yet, we didn't see that any kind of environmental issues would be related to us. It was more for women's groups rather than for, for the issue. So um, that's how MONES, for the very first time back in 2013 and 14, uh, started its work on... It was an accident, actually, that we started working on. However, in 2015 and 16. We started receiving, uh, through our International Network of Women's Funds, Prospera, we started receiving more information and that this kind of, um, in particular, on climate finance. And we attended, uh, Mona's uh, represent actually, I attended a, a big international convening where women's funds on, uh, and environmental groups were brought together. Um, So uh, that was actually an eye-opening experience for us. And um, because we already had this experience with us giving grants on environmental issues, and because there were the environmental issues and in particular climate justice or climate change was becoming a very big and imminent problem in Mongolia, which is a big um, country with, uh, with agriculture and uh, livestock as the main, one of the main sources of income, we decided that we need to actually go into that. And uh, we to actually start working, um, st you know, to build our knowledge on Green Climate Fund, on climate change. So at the beginning, we didn't even know the word Green Climate Fund. We were just started, we started studying and thanks to Prospera and to thanks to attending this uh, interesting and uh, very, um, very interesting, challenging um, convening, uh, we started building our, it was very beginning of building our knowledge. So. Thanks to these grants that we received from Philia, we were able to do a desk review. What is happening in Mongolia in terms of the climate change responses? However, because we didn't have any expertise in this area, we hired a consultant who helped us to conduct this study. Um, and at the same time, we started, you know, this... Um, a study on gender responsive strategies. On one hand, we will study what is the national and legal policy framework on climate change. On the other hand, what are the gender responsive strategies? So we try to see it from both sides. And for that, you know, we also hired the gender specialist who helped us to, to do that study. As a result of this, um, of these two studies, which was the beginning and uh, we weren't even sure what if this is the right first step um, 
we started looking for some expertise within our uh, Prospera network. And uh, again, with help of Philia, we uh, got connected to Gottend, um, who is on the board, and she helped us to identify Green Climate Fund as one of the major um, targets. We, uh, we heard of Green Climate Fund back in, in, at the international convening that we attended, but at the time, everything was new to us. Um, we were bombarded with all this new information, so it didn't really stick to us. Uh, so what happened, what, what helped us a lot that, you know, we reached out and we were lucky to find a, a friendly uh, support from international level who helped us to understand, to build a deeper, you know, understanding in terms of where to go and what to see. So um, based on the set of studies that we uh, conducted, there were several key findings that we discovered at the national level. So uh, women's groups, and I don't think that it is uh, applicable on, to Mongolia only, do not have direct access to Green Climate Fund. No women's fund with, or no women's group would be able to access them. Um, also, we've, we've discovered another key finding was that women's groups have quite limited access to funding that other organizations who have access to Green Climate Fund would receive. Um, because mostly these organizations would have to sign agreements with government and in this particular, in our case, with government of Mongolia. So what women's groups can do to access this funding is only when these international organizations announce calls for proposals to implement this project, then we would be able, or women's groups can apply, and if selected, they can collaborate. However, uh, Key, this key, key finding that we, we started, you know, working on was that women's groups can influence gender policy related to this Green Climate, uh, green climate Fund uh, funding that came to Mongolia through these organizations. So on one hand, we were uh, quite disappointed that women's groups wouldn't have any direct access, but in order to bring uh, change and to be able to uh, contribute to uh, promoting and protecting women's rights and to bring women's voices into these big fundings and uh, consequently a lot of um, policies and projects, uh, women's groups can influence these gender policies. So we started. Um, working on um, finding out what else, you know, in particular to the last key finding, what MONES can do. So turns out that, you know, we were very unsure of our knowledge. We were unsure of our capacity. Uh, we weren't, um, it, it, it was very, it was the start of our process or journey into this a um, big issue of environment, of climate change, of green climate uh, fund. Um, all that sounded so remote to us. So what was a good um, strategies that, again, we developed with help of international consultants and in this regard, um, uh, Lian, Lian Shalatek was also our source as well as Gottling. Gotland, so we are very happy. Uh, happy we were we are very happy that they helped us with some guidance, with some support, with some recommendations and comments. So we uh, focused our work on few points. So first of all, it is very important that we have a pool of national experts, gender experts, who are who have 
some knowledge on or who have knowledge on Green Climate Fund gender policy because there is a gender policy in Green Climate Fund uh, which is quite a powerful document. It requires that every project that is funded through Green Climate Fund uh, money should incorporate and um, implement gender policy at national level. So that was the key document that we took as our uh, guiding document and uh, which would help us to influence the decision making at national level. However, Green Climate Fund gender policy, Green Climate Fund itself is in a huge, big structure system and gender policy is also something that we needed to build the knowledge on. So we uh, started working on creating and building a pool of national experts. And we are, as I mentioned at the very beginning at, um, of my presentation, we are at the very first stage of our um, journey. So we have uh, now a pool. Uh, they are gender experts. And we are working together uh, to build expertise and knowledge on uh, gender policy of Green Climate Fund. Uh, secondly, uh, we started identifying um, proposals that would go from Mongolian uh, companies or uh, organizations that, uh, international organizations that work uh, that work. I can I can see that there is a comment saying I can't hear anything. I wonder if audio is working. Okay, okay, thank you. So, <clears throat> because it is a new area, we also, in addition to a pool of national experts, we also need some methodologies to understand how we can incorporate our expertise into the proposals. Because according to the Green Climate uh, Fund's gender policy, every proposal from national level that is going to Green Climate Fund has to have a section on how gender issues are incorporated and how they will be addressed once this proposal is approved. So we, for the for this opportunity to participate in development of proposals or to contribute to the uh, gender policy implementation in the proposals, we identified a uh, national designated authority, which is uh, uh, an implementing uh, or uh, how to say it, is a national organization that is in charge of communicating with Green Climate Fund. In our case, this is the Ministry of Environment. So we saw that in order to be able to contribute to the proposal or to collaborate with those companies or organizations that develop those proposals, we need to establish a relationship with our Ministry of Environment, which is a national designated authority. Only through this national designated authority, we are able to access those proposals. And when we started working with the national designated authority, we identified that there is another structure, there is a, a unit within national designated authority or our Ministry of Environment, which is actually a, a, a focal point of Green Climate Fund in Mongolia. And any proposal that is going to Green Climate Fund from Mongolia, from national level, has to be um, um, supported by this unit. So, as you can see, further we uh, went with our research or studying of the system, how this international big funding structure is implemented at national level, we were able to identify those um, units or organizations that actually work on the proposals. And so first we identified how we can contribute to promoting the women's voices and women's rights for this funding. And secondly, we identified the um, structure where we can 
start you know working for interventions and word inter intervention probably is not the uh, exact word because monas in the past as uh, many other women's groups worked from outside to uh, conducted advocacy supported advocacy efforts and in this case we saw an opportunity to collaborate that building a partnership and collaboration where we work together is the best strategy and when we in initiated discussions with the ministry of environment with the focal point unit we saw that there is also an, in, an interest on their side to participate with women's groups. So we were happy to see that there is a mutual interest in collaboration. Of course, there is an interest on our side, but we were quite happy to see that there is an interest on them on the other side. As the uh, gender special, uh, specialist at the Ministry of Environment shared with us, they saw that requirement from the Green Climate Fund that gender policy is something very important has to be a part of any proposal they didn't know what to do with it they didn't have any prior knowledge the, the word gender they knew the word what the word gender but they didn't know much about what is gender what is gender equality what is women's rights how to do how to do how, what to do with it how to work where are these women's groups so for them as uh, similar to our situation for them it was totally new area so when we approached them they were actually uh, <laughs> happy to see us and they w expressed their interest to even probably a a about the same time it wasn't like you know we were asking them you know we were we weren't lobbying or advocating they saw us and they said oh let's work together so um that is a very important part of our journey. And I think that identifying the partner, the right partner, who has the, um, who has the authority and who has the um, decision-making power is the key. However, on the other side, MONES is just a women's fund. We, we provide support to women's groups. We will provide support to activists. So building capacity of women's groups was another very essential part of our journey. Because once we are invited uh, and uh, invited to give our um, to give our expertise on those proposals, we have to have gender experts who have this knowledge. And so at the same time with um, creating this pool of national experts, we also saw there is a need to build capacity of women's groups. So for, for right now, like last month, we held another training for national gender experts on Green Climate Fund, gender policy. And there were 10 people, but 10 people is just a small pool. So um, helping women's groups to see the to to see this opportunity as their opportunity is another responsibility of our fund so we are working on it and it is also a journey because it took us MONES Mongolian Women's Fund probably two to two to four years to understand and accept that this is one of our core um, um, areas of work same with our women's groups they work on violence against women they work on political participation, they work on labor rights, they work on migration. So when they hear environment, when they hear climate justice, when they hear climate change, it, it sounds very far for, for them. So it is important for us to build this understanding, to bring this intersection, to help them to see this intersection. So these are these are our main areas. Hi, this is Cindy. Sorry, Belor. Um, I'm just going to let you know we some people were having some trouble hearing, but it's solved now, I think. But maybe, yeah, I'm going to have maybe if you could um, go to your last slide, the last one or two minutes, and we'll come back to you during question time after Raju's. Thanks. Back to Valor.
So I'm, Cindy, as I understand, I'm covering the last slide. Is that right? Or do you want me to go back and cover the previous one? Okay. So very quickly, there are, these are the four key areas that we saw as a important, um, important parts of our work. Okay. So, because we were able to build these um, areas, uh, developing this partnership, working with the um, with the experts, um, developing some methodologies, which are uh, still at the very initial stage. Last week, um, yes, now it is like two weeks ago. Mon Monas organized a workshop with women, with women activists, and we had our very first proposal that we worked on. And here I would like to thank both ends who contacted us and uh, said that there is a proposal coming from Asian Development Bank. And this is a huge project. Um, it is on uh, affordable housing and resilient urban renewal project. This is huge. The total amount was around 500 million US dollars. And uh, it was going to the GCF board meeting. So we worked on real proposal. And that had a dual effect on our uh, women activists. On one hand, we all felt excited that we are finally able to start you know, working on a proposal which had been discussed for a while. Secondly, we got scared. Because this is, again, this is a huge proposal. This is a mega proposal which is going to change the face of our uh, suburban poor districts. However, uh, we cannot stay scared because once this proposal is approved and once it is getting, once it gets into an implementation stage, we need to make sure and use this opportunity to make sure that women's rights are reflected, that gender, uh, gender equality or gender issues are included. Um, we weren't as well prepared, of course. Um, our experts or women activists who had uh, who attended several uh, a couple of trainings before, none of them and nor Mones, we expected that it will be such a huge task. We had to go through the entire project to understand, in order to understand it. And we, in order to work on the gender um, policy section. Um, we learned our lessons from this project, uh, from, our, um, from our experience, that we need to spend more time and more attention to build our expertise because it is absolutely important that we bring women's voices into these proposals. Not just, uh, for instance, Asian Development Bank, um, for sure they hired some gender experts to develop this, uh, uh, this section on gender policy, on gender equality. However, uh, I'm pretty sure that most of this expertise came from abroad. So it is our responsibility to work further to ensure that women's voices from Mongolia or Mongolian women's voices also are brought to this um, to this platform and um, their opinions are delivered. So, what are our lessons? We need to build our expertise. We need to be we uh, we need to build first of all our expertise on reading these kind of mega proposals. Uh, huge proposals. This time it was 500 million. Next time it could be 200 million, which is still huge. Secondly, we need to be able not only to respond on the section on gender action plan, but to be able to comment, to give comments on gender action plan in, re in relation to the entire proposal, to the big proposal, not only to respond to the outcomes and targets in this section, which actually fits into pages, but to be able to understand and to be able to relate and to be able to provide uh, 
good comments and comments which are more, um, you know, also higher level. We are not fully satisfied. We are, <laughs> we are not actually satisfied with the level of our, um, with our um, responses, but it was our first experience. And after the, we sent our uh, comments, um, we held another meeting discussing what we need to do next in order to be able to provide meaningful uh, comments. So there is um, a lot of work to do. So very quickly, there is a link if you would like to see, there is a link and probably it will give you some insight into how these proposals work. Um, all formats are the same for all the proposals that I know will go from Mongolia from national level and I assume and I, I'm, I'm sure that Raju and Cindy and Dan, they will be able to comment on it. So to understand the structure of the proposal, to understand the gender uh, green climate fund structure, also to make sure that having a very good understanding of gender uh, policy, those are the like foundation. So thank you, Balor. Thank you so much because there was a lot of information in here, but it was it's very clear, you know, for yourselves, it started with your grantees, you know, bringing to your attention climate change and where you're now a few years later is, you know, really building these, these partnerships with the ministry. And this last example for everybody, um, you know, is really the, the, I think where we all want to get to that if we all can find each other, so the CSO observers at the GCF board meeting, getting the information, we can find each other to know where persons like yourselves can acti act actively, um, you know, organize the input from your activists and your groups on the ground. I mean, hopefully, step by step, we will all be getting sharper and better at this and then have the influence that we want um, at, at the, at the, um, at the level. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to suggest that, um, um, actually, Raju, I'm going to ask you to present now, and then I'm going to take some questions, and then we will do the video because we're running a little uh, longer, but then I want to be able to have the video at the very end so those who want to stay on can stay on for the whole and who, who might need to get off will get off earlier. So Raju, Raju, um, it, the floor is yours now. He's uh, live from us from Nepal, and as I said, he's just back from the GCF board meeting. So, Raju, if you could maybe take about 10 to 12 minutes, and um, and 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 um, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Siddhi. Um, well. Um, Hello, everyone. Hello from Nepal. Um, I don't know, it's a very different time zone, I think, at different places. Um, I think it's a very good uh, good uh, start, uh, the way the Bolero has really started our presentation. Um, I will have my presentation done in about roughly 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, having said that, well, if there's, if some, there's something that I do very technical or anything like that, please uh, put in a question. I will try and uh, address that later. But probably uh, the, uh, the technician can also maybe help me with the slides. Can you put up the slides? I don't see my slides up. Uh. Hi, Raju. I will move the slides for you. Uh, just so you know, um, when you have the floor, you will be able to move the slides yourself by clicking on the arrows that are just next to the slides. Back to you. Thank you. Well, I will. I think now everybody can see my slides uh, up there. Uh, probably, uh, as I said, I will do my presentation in about like you know ten to twelve minutes. But given that, I will focus a little bit on the um, process, how the uh, uh, organization get accredited to the UNFCCC, and then come to some of the experience of our work here. Um, well, just to uh, let you know that uh, I don't work uh, primarily for a very implementing organization. We mostly do issues related to policy aspects, focusing on climate finance, a little bit on adaptation and GRR issues. So mostly what we're doing is engaging 
primarily with the stakeholders from government to civil society, then preparing actually to influence the policy processes and also empower the uh, the stakeholders so that we can effectively get engaged into the GCF process. Um, it doesn't move. Uh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I think. Uh, oh, it, When straight to the end of the story, I just I'm having problem with the. Okay, there we go. Let's just let me, let me just start with uh, uh, what what's in the Paris Agreement because I want to come straight to my point and not explain too much about climate finance. But I'm sure that you have you might have participated in the past and talked about this, as Cindy explained in the beginning. But this is something I want to really highlight that the of course the developing countries are getting access to financing to address climate change. And this is something that has been addressed in the Paris Agreement, but also in the larger framework of the uh, climate change. And one of the things that is very much highlighted in the document is how the projects and the plans that the countries really implement has to be a country-driven priority. How the need of the country has to be really focused on. That's where I want to come and I'll explain that later on. Not just that, but if you look at the Green Climate Fund, the governing instrument of the fund also talks about very clearly saying that we encourage a country driven approach and then that's the, the with the involvement of the relevant stakeholders so when you talk about the stakeholders it is not just about the government accessing funds from the uh, green climate fund but there are a variety of other stakeholders that needs to get access into this process uh, so i will explain that in a while but i just wanted to give a little bit of the context here here now on the now in order to get access to the gcf fund of course there is this not everybody can access the fund that the GCF has. You'll have to be, any entity that wants to get access to the GCF fund will have to be accredited at first. And then in, in the process of doing that, there are certain fundamentals that the organization or an entity will have to be, uh, will have to meet. For instance, you know, there are certain uh, fiduciary standards that are principles that the entity has to meet. There are some environmental and social safeguards that, that, uh, uh, that the fund will look into and also the gender policy. These are very three things that you'll see in the slides that is very important. But having said that, in order to get through the process, of course, there are two types of, uh, or I can also say three, but then basically there are two types of entities, uh, modalities that it, uh, that one uh, an entity can access the funds from. One going for the direct access modality, which means uh, national entities can access the digital resources, and the other one is international entities like MDBs and UN agencies can get that. But in order to do that, of course, there are like six investment criteria that the fund will assess based on how it wants to move ahead. Your entity can really fulfill that those uh, criteria or not. But having said that, you know, any entity has to fit for the purpose that the GCF is set for. So in order to meet the objectives of the Green Climate Fund, there are certain aspects that the entity will have to be made. Like, of course, depending on the size of the organization, you can also be accredited for micro size organization, small, medium, or even large ones. But then, of course, like, uh, if, if you want to go, uh, okay, so I'm, I think I'm speaking a bit faster, so I'll just try and uh, be slow. In order to get that, you know, you've seen the slide that there, you know, you have to meet the objectives of the fund. At least the project size has to be fulfilled. The environmental social category risk that one uh, entity will have to look into how you want, what kind of risks that the entity wants to really take. And as I said earlier, the diffusion standards. I don't want to get into detail, but I feel like these are just a few things which, which is very key. But um, um, but then you can uh, probably go back. But having said this, now in order to have this, I will go into the part that is of the direct access, which is, which is where I'm going to really focus on because I think um, GCF has a great value in promoting the direct access part. International entities were always there, like UN agencies or MDBs were always there and they were functioning. But one of the good opportunities that the uh, direct access really gives is, you know, there are, there are several things that um, that, that the uh, organization really uh, is, uh, you know, the GCF is really focused on. When we said direct access, this is a very hard fought concept. It was not easy to get this access. Uh, under the Green Climate Fund. So this is a new thing that everyone is really looking into. Of course, we had a little bit of experience from the Adaptation Fund, but having said that, you know, there was a lot to learn from the Adaptation Fund and apply in the Green Climate Fund. 
so that any entities from a national level entities would be empowered so that they can access resources from the international source, implement in the in their home countries based on their priorities. There's a bottom up approach that, that they can really look into. And then this would bring multiple multiplier effect that you look into not just your own country or entity doing the work, but looking at international entities, other countries and national institutions working, and they're really saying that this is how inclusive the process should be in order to implement a project from the Green Climate Fund. Look into the gender aspect, look into the indigenous people's rights, look into how you involve the communities. And all this process of zero taxes is very, very key when you look into this, this process. But then it's not just the, uh, the direct access. You know, the Green Climate Fund has even moved beyond that. It says enhanced direct access, which means that you can agree on a, pro a program at the GCF level, but then you have the devolved decision-making process at the national level, which means that the countries are giving much more power. What kind of project that the, uh, the you know, sub-projects that they can identify and implement in certain areas? This is where you involve stakeholders and then really design. If you look at this figure that I've just shown in a country driven process, when you talk about this country driven process in the, or the dirt access approach, we often think that this is government where, the, uh, where it's um, mostly responsible for. But I want to move a little beyond that. Of course, any projects that we develop through an entity that goes to the Green Climate Fund is based on countries' national plans and priorities. But having said that, you know, there are lots of other stakeholders, also very I mean, key stakeholders involved in this process. It is just not the government. The uh, country driven uh, process goes beyond government entities or government process. It also involves, you know, indigenous groups. It, in the, it involves marginalized uh, groups. It, it in, uh, involves communities that, is, that the project is really going into and also the gender aspect, which is very key and fundamental in the GCR process. Unfortunately, in the last board meeting, we were supposed to, you know, the board was supposed to revise and bring out a new gender policy. But unfortunately, that did not happen. You know, therefore, just because of the ego of a couple of board members that had to be, I mean, postponed or, or, or sent to the next board meeting. I hope that you know, this, this policy is really passed in the next uh, board meeting. Now, looking, just giving you this little process of the, there's lots of opportunity that comes when you talk about the, uh, you know, direct access of the, uh, the country driven approach that, that we really talk about. Because often the whole idea about this uh, country uh, you know, drivenness is something that, you know, all the time we are, we, we, we are in a comfort zone that somebody else was doing work for us. For instance, there were lots of UN agencies coming and doing. For instance, in Nepal, we have had UN agencies working here for over 50 years, or maybe you know, MDB is working for over 50 years and supporting. Now, this is something that we're trying to test new thing as well. It means that entities that are registered and are working in a country are in the driving seat. It means that the country has its own institutions, be that private sector, be that NGOs, be that uh, you know, government entities. And these entities really develop project proposals, take it to the DCF, get it approved, and come and implement on the ground. It means that you know, we are not relying much on the international institutions. So we are changing the rule of the game as what we used to be in the past. We are saying that national institutions going at the international level, showing their capability, really being empowered, and trying to help and move climate actions at the national level and subnational people with a very inclusive process. So this is a very uh, big opportunity for countries like ours to develop national institutions that works in a fashion that is acceptable to the international standards. So that is the fundamental of this direct access. So this is very core cool to my heart as well, and this is something that I've been always advocating on that, you know, of course, we have always had international entities. We might need the support for many more years, but these are the national institutions are the ones that will help develop, empower, and grow really the climate actions on the ground. But of course, as I said, the, all those opportunities lie, but they also come with challenges. You know, they're, they're, they're just not like, you know, it's, it's just moving away from the comfort zone. There are many uh, entities or the government officers who think that in the past, it was done by someone else. So let's not, you know, step on the toes. Let's not let them continue to do this work. So it's also sometimes coming out of your comfort zone and saying, allowing and then and, and trying to come uh, to tell the international institutions, hey, maybe we also want to do something new for ourselves. We want to be, you know, we have to try something new that we can do our climate actions on our own, on our own, and building our own institutions. This is something a big challenge I think I see at the NS level. And then there's a lot of empowerment that has to be done. Now, just coming at the, uh, uh, looking at the, uh, 
experience from Nepal. We did a we did a little bit of case study with the uh, support from both ends and also uh, Oxford Climate Policy and help with us together in Nepal. And we look into the LAPA process in Nepal, you know, local adoption plan of action. This was something which was really uh, the national government came out with a framework that was a very inclusive framework and that tried to implement through a project supported by defeat. And in this analysis of this NSTRAD access modality, we thought that maybe some of the learnings from this process can be taken to, uh, to GCF so that we know what are the values of this uh, process. And it, it was very interesting to come out with this, uh, this some kind of conclusion from this, uh, from this study. It really, this when you allow national institutions to take the work forward, it is much more looking into the national systems. Uh, sorry, like, you know, I'm, I'm still being uh, very fast. I think the translators have, are having a little prob uh, problem. I'll try and uh, slow down. Uh, sorry about that. Um, as I was saying, that EDA is a process that really also helps coordinate and consolidate others' ideas. It is all about capacity building and also confidence building for national institutions so that delivery can be really made on the ground that people where the climate affected people are really on the ground can, um, you know, get the benefit uh, that is being delivered by the national institutions, who understands them, who is being very inclusive. We're trying to incorporate their, you know, cultural values and lots of other aspects as well. And it also gives a little bit of flexibility, because if you look at the uh, the national system, sometimes they might uh, changes might be needed. Hence, it allows that flexibility. And it's also reaching to the most poor and vulnerable on the ground. That you know, if there's any issues. Uh, the gender issues, the ind indigenous people's issues, they can always bring it to the uh, to the concerned uh, authority or the, uh, the party to say that hey, we need to be more inclusive. I think there is much more, uh, you know, uh, ownership and much more effectiveness when a national institution really delivers this work on the ground. That's something that we have found out from the uh, from uh, from the our uh, study. Similarly, there is a little bit of framework here, of course, for our case. Is unlike uh, uh, um, in Mongolia, we have this uh, Ministry of Finance as their NDA. There is uh, this green and uh, blue box are the ones that is a government uh, system. But on the other side, we have you know Climate Finance Steering Committee and Technical Committee. And uh, fortunately, I I am a part of the Technical Committee. This is something that you know, regularly meets and talks about and what what can be done, what ideas can be really brought into. You know, this is a really ongoing. But this is a learning process for us as well. But again, it's, it's something that is that is uh, that the company, uh, government is trying to move forward with. Now, uh, if you look at the current context in Nepal, I, which, which I want to draw our experience on is, you know, there are four entities in the process of being accredited to the GCF, and there are four funding proposals being developed. But at the same time, if you see this in this process of doing this, you know, there are several meetings of the technical committee being done. Now, when the pro projects are being written in the uh, project site. There are consultations taking place to develop project proposals. You know, women groups are being consulted. Indigenous groups uh, uh, are themselves doing consultation, what needs to be done for them. So I think this is a very good practice that we have seen, but we would like this to continue in the, uh, continue in the future as well. You know, it's just not about you know, uh, uh, saying that the formalities, but in actually in practice whether this is happening or not. This is something we're a bit behind, Nepal is a bit behind in terms of submitting the funding proposal, but we have to make sure that this is the process is really in right place, and then this, uh, the concerns of the people of the stakeholders are being met at the moment. And we want to make sure that you know the, all the stakeholders are getting engaged in this in this process as well. Um, just uh, just uh, sorry, I, think I just uh, sorry that this is moving forward. Some of the experience I want to share about our work here is. Climate finance itself is a very new thing for, uh, for lots of stakeholders in Nepal. We are yet you know, trying to really come together, those who work in climate finance, and really say that this is something we need to get engaged with because a multi-billion dollar plus funding proposals are being uh, written at the moment. So in this process, how are these stakeholders really engaged? Whether it's CSOs, whether it's indigenous people's groups, whether it's uh, gender issues, whether it's a community, you know, we really want to make sure that this, you know, the, uh, these stakeholders are being engaged in the, in the process. So, what we have really done from last year is, you know, uh, we have also formed a little informal group uh, called the Climate Finance Group, and then where there are several organizations of different stakeholders really engaged in this process. We want to make sure that first all these organizations really understand the value of uh, engaging the climate finance process, but at the same time also making sure that our government is 
also following certain principles and standards that it says it wants to follow. And then it's also not only doing it at the national level, but also doing it at the sub-national and the community level. Uh, we have had several meetings. We will continue this uh, throughout this year as well. Uh, of course, we have also done some publications in local language as well as English, which is also available in our uh, the website, if you, if you just in case you want to see that. And development dialogue and where, where different can uh, uh, to share their ideas. We will go as a group to, to the government if, there, if things are not being really done in a manner that it should be. And will this idea about Green Climate Fund given, giving us a different experience is really moved ahead in a very participatory and inclusive manner. This is something that we really want to ensure. So finally, in, the, uh, in, my, in my last slide, what I would really want to say and then take away from our work that we have done is, you know, this is, you know, there, this is a very difficult thing to get engaged sometimes because it's also a new topic and many people don't understand what Green Climate Fund is or what the whole climate finance debate is all about. But I think there is a lot of learning that we can make from the uh, development assistance and correct them in the climate finance um, part, I mean, whether it's in a in a general climate finance or in specific to uh, green climate fund. You know, we, we organize, uh, it, it's important that we organize meetings frequently, invite speakers from whether it's government or, you know, or experts who are into this field, whether it's gender related or indigenous people. We have this and we will continue to do this. Uh, and I think this is something that we need to really prepare ourselves in order to get engaged effectively. We'll also have, I know it's, it's important to organize lobby meetings with the government and also, you know, accredited uh, entities, uh, that's, uh, or it's, whether it's a potential entities, and also inform and invite the government representatives and other stakeholders to work and, and then have this work go, uh, go forward. Now, having said that, what I really want to end and really uh, focus on is, you know, Green Climate Fund has given us a new avenue to think that, you know, development or the projects can be done in a different modality. It can be done in a very inclusive manner. It can, it, uh, you know, it can consider a gender, um, uh, local communities, indigenous people, in a manner that where other projects have really not done this. We, have, uh, we are able to engage with the uh, Green Climate Fund directly through CSU representatives. This is something very open and, and, and in, in a way, a, a nice thing for us. So, you know, the modality of what we, what used to be in the past, like, you know, all international entities coming and doing work for us, we want to move away from that and say that, see, this is something, an opportunity that has come to us. It is empowering the, from the local communities to stakeholders, to women issues, women groups being empowered, to indigenous people saying that this is what our rights are and this has to be respected, that that level of engagement really has to be. Maybe it is a bit slow, but I think taking right steps from the very beginning is very key because once, and that is the very reason why also the whole issue of G, uh, Green Climate Fund has to be established. Otherwise, there were already several UN agencies. There was Jeff, there was the you know, World Bank, there Several other uh, funds and uh, MDPs are there. But why did we need, really need to have Green Climate Fund as a new fund? Basically, precisely for these principles to be really met, where all this inclusivity is really considered. And then whether it's choosing a national entity to go into uh, be a part of the GCF and aggregate, whether it's about developing a concept paper, whether it's about writing a funding proposal, or whether it's about I mean, once the funding proposal has been accepted, taking that into the ground, really implementing that. In the entire cycle of this project and, uh, and the choosing of entities, we need to ensure that the stakeholder engagement, women's participation and gender and all these uh, indigenous people issues, that the fund is very key on saying that we will make improvement on, has to be really abide by. Because it's just talking at the international front is not sufficient. We want to make sure that things are actually happening on the ground, that things are really being taken on the ground. That is where the difference can really be made. And I think by really having this kind of engagement, this really promotes uh, our work here. Thank you very much. Maybe I took a little bit longer, but uh, sorry about that. Thank you, Raju. No, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And um, and uh, thank you for uh, bearing with us as we had to uh, make sure the translators could keep up with all of us. It's all uh, a new thing for all of us as well, I think. Um, I, I do, we do have a couple of questions for both yourselves and Balor. Um, but, um, and so I'm going to let you think about them while the video of Lisa goes on and then we'll come back, um, to, and so some of the like, a question for Balor is, you know, where should women's organizations start when they start to engage? What would be, 
your advice looking back what what do you wish you had known uh when you started and to 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 let let the other funds on the on the, on the cloud benefit from that wisdom wisdom and raju i think for yourself i mean one of the questions that's come up um is you know are you optimistic that this pilot enhanced direct access um is actually going to result that the money reaches local communities better and then if you are optimistic or if you are pessimistic i mean what is actually it is a pilot so until when does it get evaluated in nepal what year and and how do you have any sense of um how it's decided whether it gets expanded to other countries but um let me let you guys think about that a little bit um to our audience we're going to go about 10 minutes late so if you do need to leave us we understand but um uh right now i'm going to pass it back to andrea um and if you could now um put the comments from lisa on the online from micronesia conservation trust who as i uh, told you all in the beginning micronesia conservation trust is a really interesting success story because it is the first small grants fund that has successfully not just got adaptation fund um accreditation but now has full accreditation for green climate fund. Go ahead Andrea. Okay, thank you very much Bridget for having me. Um it's always a pleasure to uh, make a presentation to colleagues and friends. Um my name is Lisa Ranahan Anton. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Micronesia Conservation Trust. Um so the our, our organizational vision we're a small NGO based in the Mi Federated States of Micronesia. Um and our uh vision statement reads and during partnerships that conserve our land and see to improve the quality of life for communities across Micronesia and to do this we build partnerships raise and manage funds make grants influence policy and provide conservation financing and expertise we were established in 2002 under the the laws of the uh, federated states of Micronesia as a and um we since earned a 501c3 tax exempt status um in the United States with the IRS um we manage um endowment funds and sinking funds uh the endowment fund currently is at about 21 million dollars and we use these the revenues um from the endowment and from the sinking funds that we raise to benefit Micronesian conservation NGOs local governments and communities and um our technical partners as well um we again we started in uh 2000 and two um we started active grant making in 2004 and we were very small since then we've grown to manage um <coughs> three major uh, endowment funds one to uh to fund uh, the uh, recurring operational costs for um protected areas networks um under the Micronesia challenge uh we have one a smaller endowment for a conservation easement in the state of Koshrai called the Yellow Conservation Easement Endowment Fund um and we have uh, a small op uh, MCT operational endowment to fund some of our recurring costs ourselves internally um we also manage sinking funds from all sorts of different donors and we regrant to uh small organizations and projects uh around uh biodiversity conservation climate change adaptation and capacity building um in the region <coughs> excuse me um we started to go for um accreditation to these larger funds the adaptation fund and the the green the green climate fund in about 2012 and because our accreditation to the GCF which is the topic today um was based on our uh, accreditation to the um adaptation fund it's important that i start the discussion with that because um actually the bulk of the accreditation work happened <coughs> with the adaptation fund um beginning in 2012 um and in 2012 we had technical assistance from the nature conservancy they helped us put together our application and walk us through all of the sort of the review process and the Uh, organizational changes that we had to make in order to get uh, accredited and they helped us with a lot of the kind of back and forth with the uh, adaptation fund secretariat um they asked us to make a lot of uh 
revisions and improvements um, based on the initial reviews of our application. Um, and these included strengthening some our procurement procedures, our anti-fraud policy, our whistleblower policy, um, and um, <coughs> they had a lot of kinds of concerns about the level of regranting that we've done with our local partners because our typical grant that we make out is, you know, between $20,000 and $50,000, and um, that wasn't to a level of uh, that they want that uh, the standard review process required for the Adaptation Fund Accreditation Committee. Um, they were look they wanted us to be able to demonstrate track record of uh, managing, you know. Uh, awards in the millions of dollars rather than awards that we were making twenty thousand thirty thousand um, dollars and they also said that we needed to have an internal auditing function they wanted more oversight from our board of trustees and so on and so forth and so it took a lot of back and forth of us explaining that we don't make grants of this size um, and that you know we can't have a uh, you know there's no way for us to demonstrate that track record in that we've never done it and we didn't we don't see foreseen we don't foresee doing it in the near future. Um, and then with a staff of 10 people um, and, you know, the size of our operations, an internal audit function was really just not realistic. Um, so, like I said, there was a lot of back and forth. And then in 2014, in October, um, the Adaptation Board, fund, uh, board approved what they call the streamlined accreditation process. And we were accredited in March of 2015 with some conditions based on that streamlined process and on our limited track record in terms of managing larger awards so that um, we could only apply for up to a million dollars. And we had to um, give them specific procedures around um, procurement for projects that we would submit, and um, they wanted some stronger oversight from our investment committee. Um, so based on that, we went forward with our GCF accreditation um, because um, you know we felt that in the, uh, MCT, we serve three independent countries in Micronesia, all with different levels of um, technical and uh, funding resources available and um, and then so, so we felt that um, the, the the adaptation fund and the green climate fund would serve as a uh, especially the green climate fund would serve as a resource to build around uh, to support regional uh, initiatives because right at this point uh, the adaptation fund accreditation is only for the FSM and so and because there are these three different kinds of levels of and kinds of different ways that the countries are treating their 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 work. Um, the adaptation fund, but especially the green climate fund, would serve as a way to build support, build and support regional initiatives, um, and that these these two sources also bring additional resources for the implementation of the Micronesia Challenge work and related initiatives, um, and also just the fact that you know being accredited to these. Uh, Global funds will raise is is you know helping us to continue to raise Micronesia's profile on the international stage, um, you know with a view to increase, increasing um, attention and resources coming to the region, and it also increases donor confidence in investing in Micronesian initiatives and organizations. So you, we build a a foundation of trust um, that you know we can manage these kinds of uh, resources and these funds in Micronesia. Um, so with the accreditation, like I said before, for, for the GCF, um, because we were accredited to the Adaptation Fund, um, we, were able, we were eligible for fast-track accreditation to the GCF um, so that we only had to consider requirements that were outside of the scope of the other accreditations. Um, there was a little bit of uncertainty at the beginning as to, um, you know, because of the fact that we were accredited under this streamlined process with the adaptation fund, whether those restrictions would then also come through to the GCF accreditation. Um, but it turns out that they haven't. Um, we're accredited up to the micro levels, up to the full $10 million for the micro accreditation. So that didn't, that didn't end up being a concern. Um, we took advantage of the offer from the Secretariat for the gap assessment to be conducted by PricewaterhouseCooper, and we did that in March of 2016. And again, because you know we had these other concerns, and, we, and because we just finished one accreditation process that raised some um, issues, um, we went through the a gap assessment, um, kind of pretending that we were going to um, 
go through the regular GCF accreditation process. So we did the gap assessment based on the full set of accreditation requirements um, with the, the idea that we then decide whether we wanted to be fast-tracked or not. Um, <coughs> and so the, the, um, the gap assessment, um, had, we had some results that came up. Um, the internal audit was still an issue. Um, they wanted updated TORs for communities, and there was a whole list of things that the accreditation, the gap assessment uh, brought up. And then you can see these little green check marks on my, my um, presentation. These are things that we had either taken care of by the end of the gap assessment or we took care of uh, you know, shortly thereafter. Um, and that um, the one remaining real kind of issue was the um, communications policy and we're we've just actually received some support to um, to handle that right now so we should have all of these things taken we have all of these things taken care of um, and have made that progress um, and since and I've neglected to put it into the um, presentation so I'll briefly say that um, we have an action plan based on the gap assessment results all set up so we're going to deal with all of those issues that were still outstanding um, and you know we were looking for support and ways and we have strategies for to, for handling all of those things but the actually the added the, the GCF secretariat staff almost pushed us actually to go ahead and submit our application um, as is with all of the things, those remaining um, outstanding issues because they wanted us to take advantage of the, um, the, the GCF board's stated um, prioritization of direct access entity accreditations and Asia Pacific uh, and accredited entity applications in 2016, 2017. So we went ahead um, with sort of some outstanding standing concerns and submitted our application in 2016 at the end of December and we were accredited at the board meeting in July of 2017. So um, we have since then become accredited and there was actually a much shortened list of remaining issues that they want us to do post accreditation before they'll accept any applications from us. And I think there are five outstanding items and we've taken care of three of those already, and so we're very close, you know, we've signed our, um, our AMA, and so um, we're really, we're, we're ready to make applications. Um, in summary, um, I was asked to talk about what the main obstacles were to, um, or maybe they weren't obstacles because we've been accredited, but um, kind of the challenges. Um, the biggest one was inexperience. Uh, the inexperience on the part of the, the, the two funds, the Adaptation Fund and the GCF, and our own experience, inexperience. The Adaptation Board, <laughs> Adaptation Fund Board, um, you know, had never really thought about how to apply their accreditation standards to small organizations like ours. Um, and so, again, it took a lot of back and forth between us and the Secretariat, you know, with the help of actually a lot of this, of, of of the Secretariat staff kind of, you know, working as an advocate for us to the board. Um, and they, they came up with three different options of how to accredit small entities. The board chose one. They called it the streamlined one. And so, you know, we had a lot of support from our technical partners, especially the Nature Conservancy, um, that had kind of like technical experience around these kinds of issues. And so, you know, there was a lot of back and forth, and we had a lot of help with that. Um, and then our own our own inexperience in managing large projects. We've received awards in, you know, the, you know, one million, two dollar, two million dollar range, but we'd never actually made awards out at that level, and they wanted us to be able to demonstrate that experience, which we didn't have. Um, and and we won't have in, 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 in the foreseeable near future because there's not a lot of absorption capacity on the ground for our, with our partners, and so, um, but we're building that capacity, and there's a lot of support from GCF and Adaptation Fund in terms of the kind of capacity building that needs to be do, done out here. Um, in terms of the success um, factors, what really helped us make it was, again, support from partners, technical support from, the, from TNC, endorsements and support from local governments, our NGO and CSO partners, um, and our, actually our NDAs, too, as well. Um, 
We had a lot of engagement from the secretariats. The staff of both of the secretariats were really helpful. Um, they were engaged. Um, and like I said, even the GCF um, ones pushed us, you know, and it really encouraged us to go ahead and, you know, to make the leap and, and, and to do it. Um, gave us a lot of really good advice um, and guidance. Um, and again, the GCF boards declared priorities for accred for accreditation. Um, really, we, we, we took advantage of that. You know, the timing was right. They were prioritizing direct access uh, and um, the Asia Pacific. So um, those worked in our favor as well. Our NDAs in, was engaged and proactive. Um, you know, she nominated us right away, um, you know, saw us as a partner rather than as, you know, a competitor. Um, they were supported and committed to including us into consultations and workshops and meetings um, and always really, you know, consider us part of their team at the um, structured dialogues and so on and so forth. Um, and then our participation in those dialogues and at the board meeting in Samoa especially, um, we learned a lot about the fund and its policies and procedures and, you know, we expanded our network and had a really direct engagement with the secretariat staff. So that was were all really positive factors. Um, in terms of the lessons that we learned, you just we had to be persistent. We just like never had to give, you know, gave up. Really insisted on our our positions in terms of you know things that we couldn't couldn't could and couldn't change organizationally, um, you know, and just you know when they kept telling us we needed to demonstrate the track record for you know managing uh, projects. Um, in the millions of dollars, we just, you know, had to keep saying we can't, we can't, but, you know, we want to be um, credited anyway, and so um, just to, to hang in there um, and then ask for help wherever and whenever, you know, it was available, you know, we took, just jumped at every opportunity for assistance, um, and then even asked for, you know, when we weren't sure that people would be amenable, but <laughs> no shame, and, you um, accepted all offers and then we you know kind of changed them to meet our needs um it's like in the gap assessment you know sort of treated the the gap assessment as a way to evaluate you know how we uh performed with the changes that we made in for the adaptation fund um got a lot of uh and then readiness support and so on and so forth um and then just you know always being open to guidance but making sure that we um you know only made the changes that were appropriate to our organization um, and that, you know, we treated this accreditation processes as self-assessments. And so we grew and learned. And, um, and again, we only took on the changes that made sense for our organization. We made a lot of changes to our procurement policies, but, you know, we didn't add an internal audit function. Um, and, that, um, and then lastly, our board of trustees was really supportive. Um, they were um, engaged and always, you know, acted quickly when we needed them to and, um, you know, gave us the approvals for the appro appro appropriate uh, decisions that they made. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. I hope it was helpful and informative and um, I'd always be happy to, um, you know, answer any questions. I know we can't do it live, but send me an email or um, find me some other way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to thank Lisa for that presentation because she it was fantastic that she was able to pre-record that and share with us all of that information. Um, and I think that one of the things that came up um, while Lisa was speaking uh, is directly in line with what um, uh, Titi Akonso, one of our participants, has asked, and that's, so, so Lisa was mentioning about how important that NDA relationship, so that's the, um, the designated authority, the, the ministry um, that, in her, uh, that would have dealt with um, letting uh, organizations be accredited or not, or no objection, and being their voice to the GCF secretariat. And that relationship, Lisa said, was very important to them, being their advocate. Um, and, uh, and, and while Lisa was speaking, Titi came up with the question, you know, but what are the opportunities that exist to build capacity of local organizations to be able to engage effectively with NDAs? And I think that, um, Raju, that maybe you might be best to maybe give a partial answer to that. Um, 
and so I'm going to give you the floor. And at the same time, then you might want to, um, um, let's just go with that question for the moment. Um, uh, you know, what are, what opportunities do you see or do you see gaps in this? The floor is to Raju now. Thank you, uh, Cindy, uh, for that uh, question. And also, I think it's a very pertinent question, uh, given that um, ED or enhanced direct uh, access is a very new thing. First of all, direct access under the adaptation fund itself was a new thing. But then now moving even further to that and saying we want enhanced direct access is a very new thing. Not many people, not even uh, stakeholders in the country or even the NDA really understand what is this? You know, for instance, uh, from the experience of Nepal, I think there was a question related to ours. We have not yet submitted a proposal as such under the EDA to the GCF. But there are lo uh, we did a project, as I said earlier, about the LAPA, Local Adaptation Plan of Action. There's a lot of elements that's related with the EDA that was, uh, that was implemented with support from um, UK aid and, and European Union. And where the EDA part is something that you know, you decide on a uh, in a very participatory on a project, but then you delegate or you devolve that uh, project to a local level where there is an announcement made to the local entity to say that hey, we have this objective to be met in your area or let's say this in this in the particular area on a broader objective. We would like you to we would like you entities or organization or local organization even CSOs and you know, community groups to come up with ideas how to meet these objectives. So these entities put in a project or a concept to say that they would want to deliver this with the community on the ground. So it means that the one that we applied in Nepal on the local uh, uh, LAPA was ministry had a project, but then it was taken down to district level. And at the district level, announcements were made where the local entity in that particular area could apply and then say that we would like to support in the implementation of the project. So there's a lot of devolution taking place where the money was given as a bulk and the decision was making at the ground. This was some, this is the fundamental of, uh, and the principle the idea that we would also like to see that is applied in the GCF context. Now, as I said, of course, this is a new thing. So the capacity of, in, in terms of going to that level, we're moving away from lots of internationally managed funding and projects to a locally, nationally managed, that to go to the local community where a CSO can access the resources and really um, utilize. Be this a private sector, be this a CSO, NGO, you know, a community group, any anything that is that is able to really access this uh, resource and utilize for the best of the community. This is something we're expecting out of media. And I said, this is a new concept. We cannot let this fail. But just because, you know, I, I see that lots of entities say, oh, this is very complicated. They don't have the capacity. They don't have this and that. And they always find excuses not to take this concept forward. So something that is very dear to me uh, in my heart is the concept of EDA is a direct access and EDA. That's why else I'm also involved. But, uh, and the, this, this really attracts me. This is something that empowers from the uh, sub-national level to the national level for the entities and CS to, to really say that we will be able to support, you know, meet certain objectives that the government puts in terms of um, meeting its climate actions that all these actors are able to really deliver. Now, of course, this is going to be a fight. It'll be, it is going to be a fight at the uh, GCF level. This is also going to be a fight with the NDA at the national level. As I said, because precisely because the NDA, all NDAs are the government. You're, you're, you're also giving away power for someone else to decide. It means that the fight will have to be put up. And this will take some time, but then we have to continuously say that we're trying to make this something very uh, important for us in the community. So this is something that I want to say and not really go away and ask NDA to continuously engage with them to say that, come on, involve us, involve CSOs, involve women groups, involve, you know, uh, indigenous group, and then allow us to help you implement certain process on the ground. If we continue to engage that, I think this process will also help us capacitate in the future. Thank you. Great, Raju. Thank you. I mean, I think your comments really underline also what uh, what Lisa also was saying. It's persistence. That's coming in very loud, loud and clear. Persistence in 
in following up on, uh, with, with, with your stakeholders there, uh, the lobbying advocacy that you're obviously recommending that needs to be done that you're doing there in Nepal. So, and I can imagine that the more that, uh, we all share how, 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 how that's being done, the more we can, uh, shorten that shortcut a little bit for people who are just starting that process. Um, uh, back to the question of, also building capacity of local organizations for those just starting to engage with the NDAs. I think we're going to take that question forward for a longer answer in the next webinar, um, TT. And um, that, let's let's take that to our C CSO observers who actually are going to talk a little bit more about monitoring and tracking and going from global to local. So um, we'll leave it there for now for that question. Um, but um, Balor? I want to give you two or three minutes to make a closing statement. The question that I asked you that had come up for yourself during your presentation was, you know, where should women's organizations start when they want to engage? Or, you know, what do you know now that you wish you had known uh, two years ago when you were just starting so that you, um, what would you like to relay just in a very short two-minute two minute type uh, response as a beginning. The floor is yours, Balor. Thank you. Um, I have uh, quite a few learnings, but I will concentrate on the main one um, as the foundation, as the first step, and it has already been discussed. Um, it is um, actively seeking international expertise because there are so many Internet, uh, so many CSOs have already worked at international level who have knowledge, uh, who have uh, um, recommendations, who have some strategies, uh, especially on how this international level advocacy for gender action plan can be applied or taken forward at national level that um, it would help any women's, or, uh, women's rights organization to learn from them and to kind of, you know, to take over or um, at national level and to build this collaboration. So it is not just us working at national level, but it is a collaboration between international and national uh, civil society organizations. And for that matter, it doesn't, uh, we don't need to restrict our, um, our, you know, collaboration to women's uh, international women's uh, groups or women's organizations only because, as Raju said, this is something very new. It is building, it is especially among women's groups. So actively seeking, you know, and building collaboration with international civil society organizations, for instance, like both ends, to learn and to collaborate. I think this is this is something very essential. And just, you know, just to add, because as we are speaking, it is possible that your um, government or a, a company or an organization in your country is submitting a proposal. So uh, it is important to find this expertise and collaborate already. Thank you, Balor. I think you just ended it perfectly. Time is of essence and all of us learning and collaborating. So I want to give a very warm thank you to you, Balor, and to you, Raju, for joining us real time. It's now very late, your time. Thank you for sharing your, your expertise and your thoughts. Um, and I would like to thank Lisa as well for giving us the recording and the benefit of, of Micronesia Con Conservation Trust experience. Um, I think that easily we could repeat this type of webinar and ask, okay, six months, 12 months later, where are each of you in the process? Um, and I think that would actually be something we'll take back to ourselves. Again, next webinar will be April 12th. We're going to be talking about strategies for organizing to influence and monitor and track climate finance from civil society observers and civil society or um, um, people who are trying to connect uh, what's really needed at the local level, and so we can give get a little bit more into the the uh, what's going on for at each of a few different localities than we have so far. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Presence Voice Boxer, for facilitating our first multilingual transition. 
translation. Have a good day, everybody. Signing out.